So welcome everyone to um, the next installment of the SOA seminar series, this one on sulfur cycling at high latitudes. Uh, this webinar is being hosted by the Biogeochemical Exchange Processes at Sea Ice Interfaces Research Community, um, also known as BEPSI. And uh, this webinar is embedded within the BEPSI annual meeting, the in-person component, which is, be is uh, being held in, in beautiful La Jolla, California, uh, which is on the traditional lands of the Kumeyaay peoples, who are still very staunch defenders of these lands. Among their recent activities, they sued the Trump ad administration for building a wall through their traditional burial grounds. So these people are not being silent. <laughs> okay, so to uh, just give you a bit of perspective on what we're doing today, and the slides advance. advance. There we go. Okay, so the SOLA science plan, which I believe um, at least some of you are familiar. So there are some people in BEPSI who are not so familiar with SOLAS, and some people in so associated with SOLAS, and perhaps. Don't aren't so familiar with Betsy. So I'm going to give you a little bit of, of institutional context here. Um, the Solar Science Plan is, is uh, organized around five uh, fundamental research themes. And the previous SOA seminars have been focused on some of those core themes. However, the SOAS recognized that um, there are the Solar Science Plan also includes, includes a number of what are called integrated topics which um, study all five of the core themes in, in an integrated manner to understand a particularly um, vulnerable system or, or important system. And one of those is polar oceans and sea ice. And, and this, is, this, this figure summarizes the SOAS focus on uh, polar oceans and sea ice. Now, in terms of the relationship between SOAS and BEPSI, BEPSI was first launched as a score working group with support from SOAS. And after three or four years, as BEPSI was winding down, um, as the score working group was winding down, BEPSI went back to SOAS and also uh, to click and SCAR to get support to get continuing support. And all three of these organizations do still support Pepsi on an ongoing basis. At the same time, SOLAS was also um, supporting another research community on the cryosphere and atmospheric chemistry, which is also co-sponsored by the International Global Atmospheric Chemistry Program. Everyone getting all of these acronyms, they're really important, there will be a quiz later. <laughs> Okay. Of course, Ketch and Bepsi have always spoken to each other and cooperated very well. And just a couple of years ago, got together to um, propose another, a new score working group called Sea Ice to Clouds that looks at the relationship between sea ice and aerosols and cloud formation and the feedbacks in that system, which was approved by SCORE. We will be hearing. Okay. And score, oh, uh oh, forward. And score also just, and then two years ago when Sea Ice to Clouds was approved by score, and then just this past year, score has approved yet another working group looking at dimethyl sulfide um, uh, uh, production and cycling. And our speakers today uh, come from both the Sea Ice to Clouds and the MS Pro uh, programs. And so, this just to go back to the SOLA summary figure, we're going to be looking at this right hand side today and, and the sulfur cycling. So that, that gives you the institutional perspective on what we're hearing today. Now I'm going to hand it over to Jacqueline and Stephens to uh, give you the scientific context of our uh, webinar today and introduce our speakers. Over to you, Jack. Muted. Jack, you're muted. Now I'm not. Oh, uh, we hear you now. Uh, 
And now I have to start. Yep. Do you see this in the correct view? Yes, we do. Good, good. Okay, thanks, Lisa, for introducing Bepsi. Um, uh, since there are also quite a few people in the Bepsi room that are not really um, relate, yeah, interested maybe, but uh, not uh, doing work on DMS, I thought I should give a very short overview of the history of DMS. So it was... Um, uh, it was actually the, the 70s when uh, James Lovelock uh, discovered DMS from the oceans, and, um, and, and then he calculated that, um, that DMS was potentially capable of uh, closing the whole uh, sulfur budget in the atmosphere, which was up till then a big mystery, uh, how, how things were uh, organized in the atmosphere. And... Uh, and that sparked a lot of um, of research and uh, uh, resulted in the so-called CLAW hypothesis in 1987. Um, CLAW stands for uh, Charlson, Lovelock, Andrea and Warren, which were the, uh, the authors of a nature paper. And they stated that the major source of cloud condensation nuclei over the oceans uh, that that would appear to be DMS, which is uh, produced by phytoplankton in seawater and oxidizes in the atmosphere to form sulfate aerosols. And their hypothesis was that the biological regulation of the climate is possible through the effects of temperature and sunlight on phytoplankton populations and DMS production, as the scheme uh, to the right uh, uh, shows you. Um, but you can also see that at the very bottom, there is a plus and a minus with a question mark. So basically, it, um, uh, also these authors of, didn't know how this could react, but it was a, pro, pro, a plausible hypothesis. So um, that sparked a lot of uh, research. And um, about... Uh, that one doesn't work. Okay, how do I get to the next? Um, uh, so that uh, resulted in the first uh, attempt to uh, to pro to produce a climatology for DMS distribution, which was published by Kettle in '99. Um, but basically, the, the the number of data that uh, he had was uh, was still too little to make a lot of uh, um, divergence. But um, they came up with something like an, uh, a, a January and a, and um, and a July estimation of the distribution of uh, of DMS in the oceans. Um, and but then uh, more people uh, started to do analysis and uh, and uh, uh, overviews of uh, of ocean ocean um, expeditions and uh, then um, Lana in 2011 um, published the next update of um, um, of DMS climatology and that looked already quite a bit better and. Um, um, and then in 2022, um, the very the last uh, climatology was produced, and that by Hulswar. Hulse, and you can already see that there the the interesting uh, areas are especially in the Southern Ocean, where you have highest DMS concentration. But also you can see that the that the uh, the range that is provided here is only up to 10 nanomolar, um, which was explicitly capped because um, there were a lot of um, additional high values, but they were uh, deemed to be sporadic um, and, um, okay, and occasional. So they were actually capped at that uh, 10 nanomolar in all the climatologies uh, up to that moment. Um, Hulswar also um, made a calculation of the, uh, where's my mouse again? Here. 
um, a, um, an overview of uh, the differences between um, the latest and the previous climatology. And here you can also see that the difference between those climatology um, indicated the largest increases around Antarctica. Um, so apparently there was a, there was in between a, a lot of uh, new data were um, uh, received and um, put into the database, and that resulted to a kind of an yeah an upgrade of the of the DMS um, uh, concentrations around Antarctica. Um, but still. Uh, all the all the, the the total range is relatively low, especially if you look at what we actually found. And then I apologize for the small numbers, but this is this is an this is um, um, an Antarctic uh, wide inventory by uh, uh, the the group of Tortel. Um, and this, this is not 10 nanomolar, but 100 nanomolar. And you see that there are quite a few places um, where they found substantially higher numbers. And also in the, the, um, uh, the, the series of, uh, of uh, the sampling that we did at uh, Rothera at the Western Antarctic Peninsula, you can see there, are, uh, there are regularly uh, huge uh, DMS uh, peaks uh, in the in the January uh, December January period. So um, apparently there is a uh, there is a lot to discover yet still even um, though the, the we we are working on it since the eighties um, and. Um, as a and, and we but we now know that there is a huge um, underlying uh, a myriad of processes and um, and in order to understand what ultimately gets into the atmosphere, uh, we, we simply have to understand the uh, the processes that lead to these concentrations. So and now and we have uh, up till now there's a, there, a lot of uh, new uh, discoveries have been done and then and I'm therefore also very um, very pleased to um, to introduce our speakers here because uh, as Bet as um, uh, Lisa already said uh, there is the new CIs to clouds um, uh, score group. Um, and that uh, has different task groups, um, of which one is the sulfur group, and uh, Sakiko Ishino is uh, is leading that that group. And we try to make to 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 put something like a, a state of the art of the of the sulfur uh, in, in in polar regions, uh, both from the atmosphere uh, into and and the ice into the ocean. Um, so and so she will give our first uh, the first presentation, uh, mainly about the atmospheric uh, role of uh, of DMS. Um, then uh, uh, Steve will give us an overview of uh, the mosaic uh, uh, campaign in uh, in the Arctic. Uh, he did a lot together with uh, Byron Blomquist. He did a lot of. Um, flux measurements and inventories of DMS over the Arctic Ocean, and he will um, uh, give us an uh, an update on uh, on where they are. And uh, well, I'm looking forward to his uh, findings. And then finally, uh, finally, um, Lisa already mentioned that there is a, a new score working group. Um, that just started a few months ago, DMS Pro, uh, led by Marty Galli and Daniela Deval, and they will um, uh, also uh, introduce that working group and um, uh, and and why it is necessary to really uh, dig into the processes of uh, that that lead to DMS production in the oceans. Um, so with this, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Sakiko uh, from Japan, uh, who will um, uh, introduce us into the atmospheric uh, 
complexity of uh, of the DMS cycle. And then I'll show right. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay. Go okay, ahead. I'm gonna go share my screen now. So is the presentation working, right? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great, thanks. Um, all right, uh, I'm gonna start my presentation. Thanks a lot uh, first for, to Jack and Lisa and Chen Chen for organizing this great seminar and also giving me this great opportunity to talk here. Actually, I'm, I'm feeling a bit nervous to give a presentation here, but I'm also excited. And as Jack already introduced, I am here as a member of CI2 Cloud's uh, working group, especially from the Sulfur Cycle sub-working group there. And today I'm gonna try to uh, make a, some summary of atmosphere, atmospheric sulfur cycle in polar regions, and also a little bit about the particle formation in polar regions, especially for the spring and the summertime when DMS becomes an important source of particles there. So, uh, and before going to the scientific part, a bit of disclaimer is that our activity itself is still ongoing. So I try to stay something uh, very basic that I can talk by my own words. So I'm afraid if something is not really clear or the talk itself not is might be not really comprehensive, but I will try my best to give a nice summary of atmospheric part, what we care in the atmospheric side to be understandable CIS biogeochemistry people. So briefly here again, in the CIS2 Clouds Working Group, we are discussing the, trying to synthesize the knowledges of CIS biogeochemistry and atmospheric chemistry within the system of uh, ocean ice atmosphere exchange processes. Uh, including the perspectives from both the Arctic and Antarctic. And the, the talk, I, uh, my talk is also an activity of our, our working group, especially for the sulfur cycle system. And here are people who is in uh, sulfur cycle subworking group. So first, I want to acknowledge to all of them for very active discussion all the time that uh, is sometimes very complicated because of the, <laughs> this interdisciplinary work. But still, I, I want to really give uh, uh, express my deep appreciation for them for uh, stimulating me to try to summarize the big picture of sulfur cycles in polar cycle region. So, all right. <laughs> So one of our activity is to create a schematic of polar sulfur cycle as detailed as possible to identify the key scientific question behind this picture, as well as to try to get some in insight of what will actually happen in the, the warmer polar regions in the future. And as most of you here know, that DMS is first produced by biological cycles in sea ice and seawater under, underneath. And then DMS is emitted to the atmosphere, probably more mostly from the sea ice edge region. And then it is, uh, they are oxidized into sulfuric acids to form particles in the atmosphere in the end. So what I talk today is about these two process. One is new particle formation first, then uh, go to the oxidation processes. And per new particle formation is uh, actually a two-step two process that include one is nucleation step that forms the ultrafine particles that the the, with the size of about one nanometer, very, very small particle, by condensation, condensation of these low volatile vapors, including uh, sulfuric acid. And the second step is the growth of those particles into 
the size of about 100 nanometer that can act as cloud seeds in the end. And this growth process are driven by the condensation further condensation of low volatile vapors onto existing cloud, uh, no, existing particles, as well as the coagulation or the collision of, of existing particles. And this is a good example of new particle formation event observed at Finnish Antarctic station Aboa. You see here that the particles with the size of about three nanometer suddenly increases in the noon time, and then they gradually uh, shift to the larger size towards, towards 20 nanometers, 30 nanometers, uh, as time evolves in a day. So this is, is a typical observation that is called banana curve. And this banana is usually, um, usually observed simultaneously with the concentration of low volatility vapors like this. And for the, the case of this event, the, the authors concluded that the, the, the driver of this particle formation was sulfuric acid, as you see here. So this is very important information to know what, what kind of particle formations are happening in the atmosphere, but still, the observation data is really, really limited in polar regions. So for the Arctic, even with those limited data, recently there are two very nice overview papers published a couple, couple of years ago. And one is from Beck et al. that includes this very nice schematic, nice figure to show the, what kind of molecules are actually included in new particle formation. And they observed the, they performed observations at Willem stations as well as near Olsen station, both in spring and summertime. And what they found is that it, at, in near Olsen station, the main driver was were sulfuric acid and ammonia here for nucleation step. And then after then they grow into the CCN size um, by the condensation together with methane sulfonic acid, MSA. On the other hand, um, at the same time, the HOM here, HOM is the, uh, sorry, highly oxygenated organic molecules are also participating at nucleation as well as the growth step. And so, and also these organic molecules are also associated, um, the part of these organic molecules are emitted from the ocean. So this might be also a part of perspective from sea ice biogeochemistry people. Now, on the other hand, it, at Willem station, what they found is the, the iodic acid. Iodic acid was the main driver of both nucleation and growth of particles. And this iodic acid were the major source of these iodine in the atmosphere is also believed to be from sea ice or snow. So this is also interesting part. And now you see this kind of different, different a variety of molecules are involved in new particle formation in the Arctic. And there are actually a kind of regional differences in mechanisms. And these findings are further summarized for a larger area of the Arctic by uh, Schmel and Bakrini in 2021. And from this figure, you can see that in most sites, the sulfuric acid is still an important driver for the most sites, but there you can see the, the contribution from organics in, at Nee Olsen or Canadian archipelago as well as the contribution from iodic acid at Willem Station, as well as the central Arctic Ocean, where the where are close to the pack ice region. So there are actually this kind of the regional variability. And by summarizing this very nice figure, the authors uh, concluded that there still needs further observation to constrain the spatial and temporal heterogeneity of these mechanisms. Otherwise, it's difficult 
to constrain the relative contribution of what molecules are really important for the particles within the Arctic uh, in quantitative way. And also there needs to be the model developed, including the per per particle formation processes by organics as well as iodic acids to assess their relative importance as well as the actual contribution to CCN, to the cloud uh, forming particles. So this is how the new particle formation is understood in the Arctic side. On the other hand, the knowledge is for the Antarctica is further limited, I would say. Uh, the available evidence so far finds the new particle formation at, by sulfuric acid and ammonia, as I already introduced, and also another work by Brian et al. at Antarctic Peninsula here finds that alkyl amines and other base molecules are also important driver of new particle formation there. And also important thing, in, interesting thing is that these amine species are likely to be emitted from this marginal sea ice region area of this Weddell Sea region. So also in Antarctica, sea ice is likely to be an important source of these precursor vapors. Uh, but on the other hand, there's another interesting feature of the Antarctic side that is the particle formation in the free troposphere, higher altitude, the height above clouds are transported to the lower troposphere where the observations are actually happening. For example, in a case of case near Casey station, which was actually the ship one observation, the, uh, the authors Humphreys et al found that there were uh, unexpectedly high concentrations of ultrafine aerosols that can sometimes reach to 1,000 numbers uh, per uh, centimeter cubic. Uh, when they cross the line of polar front from, from north to south, this, this is Antarctica, so it tours the latitude to, to the higher latitude. And then they also investigated the air masses or when they observed this high concentration, then what they found is that the strong air mass subsidence from the upper troposphere to the surface, ocean surface was happening when they observed this high concentration of aerosols. So from this, they concluded that the, the large, large nucleation events or new particle formation events are happening in the free troposphere and then they are transported to the lower side of the atmosphere. And another case study by Lachlan Kopp et al. is who did um, uh, year round observation of aerosol size distribution at Halley station. And what they found is that when they observed the nucleation mode, very small size particles, the air masses have traveled along above sea, uh, above sea ice, or sometimes the air mass travel above Antarctic continent from both sides. So from these observations, they drew, they drew a very nice figure here that is saying there are two major different new particle formation sources in Antarctica. And one is uh, of course, from the sea ice sources, and another is free tropospheric sources that is subsequently transported from the inland Antarctica towards the coastal sites. So now there are these different kinds of case studies showing the importance of these free tropospheric sources. But here I would like to note that the chemical species driving these, the free tropospheric events are still not known. So the possibility includes the all sulfuric acid organics and iodic acids. So now for both poles, the attention is paid to the contribution of these 
organics and iodic acids relative to sulfuric acids that are traditionally known. And this is with more clear evidence for the Arctic, but the, for the Antarctic, it's rather unclear. And for the Antarctic side, the contribution of particle formation in the free troposphere versus the sea ice, above sea ice events are still to be, needs to be explored more. So these two points are major unknowns in particle formation in polar regions, I think. So now you might think the, the, the sulfur, the sulfuric acids is less, my kind, is kind of less important for particle formation in polar region, but still I want to stress that we need to pay attention, we keep attention for sulfur chemistry. Because uh, to get quantitative understanding of this relative contribution, we still need to know the, um, the, the concentration of sulfuric acid, as well as that means that um, how much of DMS is actually converted into sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. And actually the problem is that the estimate in the yield of SO2 from DMS oxidation largely varies from 30% to 100, almost 100%. This is, this is actually the case for the, the, the mid latitude region of the, the marine boundary layer. So it's not really applicable for the polar ocean, but still the SO2 yield is highly uncertain. And also in addition to that, um, there are numbers of major developments in understanding of sulfur chemistry uh, that I listed here in recent years. So I would like to introduce these topics with the perspective of their potential importance in polar environments. So in traditional understanding, DMS oxidation undergoes with two different branches. One is called abstraction pathway that pri primarily produces SO2 in the end. And the another is addition pathway that pr partially produces MSA as well. And then the, the majority of SO2 produced here dissolved into um, the existing clouds and particle surface, particle surface water where they are converted into sulfate ions in aqueous phase. So only a part of SO2 can be actually converted into the, the gaseous phase sulfuric acid. And then an important thing is that the sulfate produced in this aqueous phase and also the MSA are both known to contribute to the growth of particles, but not for nucleation. So the ultimately important thing is that um, is how much of DMS is converted into gaseous SO2 and then end up with this gaseous sulfuric acid that is only pathway to nucleation. However, it has long been known that the chemistry involved in DMS oxidation is really, really complicated like this, as I, I will not introduce everything, but uh, there are more uh, reactions. And in this context, Hoffman et al. recently, it's, it's not recently anymore, but they, they tried to include those detailed chemistry into the, a box model to identify the importance of this chemistry. And they found, they indicated that the inclusion of this chemistry um, partitions DMS oxidation into more MSA through the aqueous phase reaction and it reduces the SO2 yield, in this case, from 60% to 24%. It's a big, it's actually a big number for us. So we, we knew that the assumptions of chemistry does a lot, does matter for the SO2 yield in the chemistry, but it was still difficult to incorporate 
these all detailed chemistry into 3D models. Yeah, it was actually the sake of the computational cost. But against this problem, uh, Chan Jie Chen et al. tried to select some re important reactions. Uh, it was 12 reactions, if I remember correctly, into a 3D model geoscam. And then they obtained these clear results that shows the, the DML oxidation gives really high amount of MSA, especially over the, uh, across the Southern Ocean region here. And then they also confirmed that the SO2 yield is reduced from 90% to 75%. So this is, this might seem not really a big changes, but still, the model is not complete, uh, not perfect, as they suggested in their paper. What, what they did is also, um, excuse me, they also evaluated the relative contribution of different DMS oxidation mechanisms, and then, then uh, highlighted the importance of this reaction, one reaction that is DMS plus BRO, the reactive bromine species. Uh, actually, the, the, this, this one have the brightest color is for the DMS plus OH radical that is already known, well known reactions. But the second most important was the, this B, DMS plus BRO reaction. And they suggested, they indi indicated that, that the, there could be a large uncertainty for sulfur chemistry, DMS oxidation mechanisms uh, arise from, the, arise from the, the uncertainties in BRO concentration itself. So actually it is- Sakigo? Um, yes. Okay. Can you uh, uh, are you can you wrap up a little bit? It's ah. over over twenty minutes now. Oh, but oh, really, yeah. I'm sorry. I expected it was for thirty minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. Ah, oh, okay. I I will go quickly. So the BRO. Okay. I'm sorry. So BRO does a lot for the sulfur chemistry and models are stru still struggling to capture the, the observed variability of BRO concentration as I shown here. So I will skip this. And another complication comes from the polar specific sources of BRO. That is for, uh, one is blowing snow emission over the sea ice as well as the direct bromine release from the snow surface. So the, these two processes also needs to be explored to better representation of sulfur chemistry. I'm sorry. So, and also I will skip this HPMTF talk because it- No, just, end, just take, take, a, take a five minutes. It's okay, it's okay. Okay, okay. yeah, but still the five minutes is, necessary for the other talk, another talk. And yeah, what I wanted to highlight here is that this newly discovered molecule, HPMTF, that was actually found two to three years ago, was, it, it seems like to be less important in polar region based on the modeling results. Because, and this is actually um, e explainable by the, the known knowledge is that the DMS oxidation mechanisms to give this molecule is preferable for higher temperature in the tropics. So it might be not less, not important for polar regions, but still, we still need more observations to constrain these findings, these modeling results. And then what I wanted to share in the end is the topic about the methane tile as a significant source of SO2. So methane tile is a sulfur species that is produced from the degradation of DMSP in ocean water as uh, similar to DMS. 
However, it has been paid less attention because it is rapidly consumed by bacteria or phytoplankton within the water. So its concentration is usually lower than DMS, as shown in here. The most of atmosphere or water, seawater samples observations have shown that methanthiol to DMS ratio is less than 20%. However, uh, against this understanding, Novak et al. tried to um, tried to estimate the importance of these new sulfur sources in the atmosphere, and they find that this methanthiol can be efficiently converted into SO2 rather than DMS, so it can act as the a significant SO2 source up to 48% of marine, total marine SO2 production in their case. And also there are um, very nice observation recently in the Arctic Ocean by Gross et al. showing that the methanthiol to DMS ratio can be up to 50% here. So combining these results, it um, it could be an important but an alternative source of SO2 in polar regions. This is just an idea, but we need to pay more attention for these mo new molecules. So finally, I wrap up my talk with this updated schematic. And here is a summary that I want to stress against that the, there are actual importance contribution of organics and iodic acids compared to the sulfuric acid, especially for the Arctic. And also we need to explore more about the free tropospheric new particle formation in the Antarctic side. And in the meantime, we need to pay more attention for SO2 yield from DMS oxidation with the, with the high large, large uncertainty coming from the the reactive bromine chemistry with the polar specific emissions, as well as the potential new SO2 uh, sources from methanthiol that is uh, evidenced by the Arctic Ocean observations. Oh. All right, that is all topic I prepared today. So, and sorry for this, the, the rapid explanation at the end. But I hope this summary is of some help for the, the listeners today. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, yeah. and, and, and apologies for, uh, for uh, speeding you up on that, but uh, it, yeah. Well, we do have time for one or two quick questions, if there are any either online or in the room. I, I have a I have a question, Sakiko. I yes. was really struck by the difference in um, the sources iodine versus um, uh, um, sulfur compounds toward uh, contributing to particle growth in Greenland and Svalbard. Are, are you actually able to say anything yet about the relative proportions of open water versus sea ice cover and whether there's any relation between that that Iodine versus sulfur um, source. Um, are you saying that the relative contribution of of sea sea ice source versus open ocean source for iodine itself, and then sulfur, right? Yeah, relative. You know, does uh, it, does, what difference does it make? Can we say anything yet? Um, okay. Uh, what I know is that. The, for the iodic acid, the, the new particle formation observed in the Arctic is usually uh, happening in the sea ice regions. So I think the, the major source of iodic acid is sea ice rather than open ocean sources in the case of Arctic. But and for the second point, I, I'm afraid to... <sighs> Actually, I, I don't know the relative importance <laughs> of iodic acid and sulfur, sulfur, 
So that, that is the one, to, one very interesting topic to be explored in the future work. Yoka, did you want to say something? There are a lot of pierces blooms uh, in, the, in this branch west of Spitzberg. So I guess that could explain why you really have there are a lot of different from the shoulder. Did you guys catch that online, what Ilka just said? Oh, no, no. Can you repeat? She was, she was talking about there being a lot of phaeocystis in the water there in, in Fram Strait. East of Fram Strait. Eastern, Eastern, the east side of Fram Strait. Okay, so we should probably move on now to uh, Steve. Thank you very much, Sakito. And all yours, Steve. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, perfect. Great, and you can see the slides, okay? Yeah, yes, Great. also. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some observations that we've made in the Central Arctic recently as part of the Mosaic Expedition program. And um, yeah, with an ultimate aim, and this is definitely a work in progress, of trying to attribute sources of you know dms in the in the central arctic atmosphere so are they are they, do local sources dominate or it, are most of the sources or dms concentrations advected from around the edges of the arctic i suppose and this has involved a big team of people so far and um yeah, most of them have done the clever bits of the work, and I'm just kind of reporting on some of the more simple aspects, I suppose, as, as usual. And what, one thing I've learned as uh, really a water side person is that as soon as you pop your head into the atmosphere, you get inundated with huge amounts of data, and I haven't been able to process it as fast as I expected to. So, um it's, like I say, it's a work in progress. All right, so I've got a, a few objectives. One is to talk about some of the concentrations, DMS concentrations we measured in the marine boundary layer in the Central Arctic. Then I'll go on to talk about some of the direct two approaches that we've used to measure DMS air sea fluxes directly in the region. Talk about some of the sources and sinks of the atmospheric DMS in that region. And then a little bit of, at the end about how we're hoping to sort of take this information further. Um, so just for people who don't know much about it, this is a, a map on the left here of the Mosaic expedition. And it involved, you know, mooring the polar stern up against a, a big ice flow over here in sort of off northeastern Siberia. And that, that was the start of leg one. And you can see the sort of dates here, they're color coded. And the black lines, the um, cruise track really of the polar stern, and then the colored lines when we were. Um, moored to this ice flow and followed the sort of Arctic drift past the North Pole and down towards the Fram Strait um, so, uh, over, yeah, almost a year that we, we did that. And what I'll talk about today is actually just data from this leg four, which is that last part of the drift. And then leg five, when there was some extra time and the boat went back up to the North Pole and did some more work up there to try and sort of finish off the time series in a way. And 
if you, the map on the right here is a you know a, a map of the flow that we were attached to and you can see the ship down here and you know the sort of scale of the flow that we were on and this was in leg four which was sort of june july august time and yeah there's lots of different surfaces on there so melt ponds second year ice first year ice and open leads and that sort of thing so plenty of complexity in the surface that we were trying to measure these fluxes in um so we used two approaches to um, measure the measure dms fluxes one was a eddy covariance system so that um examines the correlation between vertical wind velocity and concentrations of dms and you have to measure them at very high frequency 20 hertz or faster and that's really only possible possible at the moment with something like an atmospheric pressure ionization mass spectrometer and this was an instrument that byron blomqvist has built quite a while ago and it, it's one of the few around and it's um yeah it's one of the few ways of getting at directly getting at dms fluxes and in this case an inlet you can see here was mounted on on a mast off the front of the ship um and yeah that the inlet there's a few sensors on the end there that are required for the eddy covariance work and then um or calculations and then an inlet or tube runs along the gangway here down into a container in the bowels of the ship here where we had the mass spectrometer and a few other instruments and then the other way that we wanted to try and measure fluxes was using a dynamic flux chamber so instead of the sort of one kilometer squared footprint of an eddy covariance system off the front of the ship this has you know less than half a meter squared footprint and why we wanted to do this was to try and get at you know the sources of dms from the different surfaces so the ice snow open leads melt ponds sort of thing and try and uh, portion those fluxes to what we observed in the eddy covariance measurements and yeah the, we used you can see this sort of uh, funnel on the right that was our chamber our dynamic chamber and one of the you know one of the nice things about using a dynamic chamber versus a static chamber or or recirculating chamber is that you, you know you're constantly drawing in new new air at ambient concentrations and that you get very little buildup of a of you know gas concentrations within the chamber and that maintains a fairly realistic gradient between the water or ice concentrations and the atmospheric concentrations so you, you measure the concentration of the gas going into the chamber and coming out of it and from that you can calculate a flux out of the surface there or into it and this is what it looks like when you're out out on the ice so in this case we actually had some we had we were able to measure uh, methane and co2 using these two like or systems that are in one of the boxes and then in the other box we had a auto sampler that collected dms um onto absorbent tubes over you know over sort of three minute intervals as we switch from inlet to chamber measurements sort of at running from the chamber in this case on a little melt pond here and on the right you can see us this is the container crammed with instruments down the bottom and me working away at a very old gc fpd and an antiquated sort of <laughs> desorption system compared with all the other fancy stuff around on the ship at the time but including Jacqueline's PTRMS which is just across the corridor and yeah then you end up with you know your typical peaks of DMS from from that system from which you can calculate hopefully a, a chamber you know an inlet and outlet concentration for the chamber okay so the other thing that comes with the 
APIMS that Byron was able to de develop uh, are concentrations and mixing ratios of DMS measured from the front of the ship there. And these are, you know, sort of quality controlled for exhaust fumes and that kind of thing um, around the ship. And, you know, what you, what you can see is that there's, you know, a lot of variability in that DMS concentration. And I'll remind you that, you know, these early, early values here are on sort of leg four. So down here, as we're drifting down towards the marginal ice zone and actually into the marginal ice zone at the end. And then there's a break in the data just here. And this is leg five data, which was up, you know, right in the central Arctic there and considerably lower concentrations. But these very rapid changes in, in DMS concentration indicate you know, changes in air mass coming past the ship. And um, so rather than big you know, events of DMS flux from locally, these are, seem to be mainly associated with advection of air masses in, into the region. And these concentrations, you know, are pretty high, particularly those um, marginal ice, those leg four concentrations. And you can compare them to a data set collected, for instance, at Nielsen um, by Zhang et al. And yeah, you can see that as we just heard in, in the Fram Strait, you get fair cystus blooms in the spring and really high high concentrations of DMS in the atmosphere, but then, you know, they're not higher than we were observing in um, sort of July, early August, um, sort of north, just north of Greenland. And then, yeah, and then there aren't many measurements of DMS concentration in the central Arctic, but this is one of the other studies that has done something similar, and this was an, uh, the Od an Odin cruise in 2018, um, in a paper by Seagull et al. And what they show here is a sort of series of measurements of DMS from, from the North Pole. So North Pole, this side, F1, going south. And again, really, they use nanomolar per meter cubed here, and I converted it to parts per trillion. I think I've got it right, but that's about 25 PPT is one nanomole per meter cubed approximately. And um, yeah, really low concentrations up in sort of the northern sector of the Arctic and then increasing as you'd expect as you get down towards the marginal ice zone. And pretty similar concentrations most of the time that were, were observed on Lake 5. And then here's some of the eddy covariance flux data that. Byron generated and has calculated, and you can see actually these are these are low flux rates. So most most of them are less than 0.5 micromole per meter squared per day. And if you compare that to some of the other studies that Byron's been involved in, then um, you know, in the tropical East Pacific, then fluxes average nearly seven, and down to you know two and a half in the in the southern ocean on the gas x cruise there but yeah all all considerably higher than we observed in the in the arctic and central arctic there. and the re red values are values that are significantly different from zero and the blue ones are kind of pretty much zero and then if you look at the data from the dynamic cha flux chamber then yeah, I've divided it up into the different surfaces that we measured those fluxes from. And yeah, you can see in some cases we're getting pretty high high values, almost one micromolar per meter squared per day. And but for most of the time they're they're very low. And if you if you zoom in again, you can see the higher fluxes are dominated by fluxes from, from the leads, so from open leads like this one. And then, yeah, there's there's um, 
some flux from the melt ponds that kind of builds up over time it seems in lake lake four pretty low but back in the sort of central arctic and what what's kind of in what's kind of interesting is that we both both the eddy covariance and the dynamic flux chamber approaches measured um deposition of dms into the into either these melt ponds sometimes into into leads and sometimes even in into the snow and ice so, and that you know that seems to be driven by these really high concentrations to some extent driven by these high concentrations of advected dms into the region so if you're kind of imaginative what i've done here is overlay the um dms concentration in the atmosphere over the fluxes that were measured using the eddy covariance approach and you can see when when we get you know fluxes into the into the water or into the melt into the surface then it's quite often associated with high atmospheric concentrations so that that's a kind of interesting new observation that we have you always think of the ocean as a just a source of dms into the atmosphere so one of the other thing, really interesting things that we came across, and you know, it's not new really, but it's it turned out to be very important, I think, and is important, is that once we got onto in, into the area in Lake Four, there was already a a really large amount of fresh water around, and that fresh water in some cases formed a freshwater lens even over some of the leads open leads and acted seemed to act as a real barrier to um gas fluxes into the ocean so you know you take away the sea ice and you think you're going to get higher fluxes but actually that freshwater lens that developed was just as effective barrier in some cases and you can see here with you know we're sampling um a lead and measuring the flux in it but in this case now, if you look at a sort of near surface depth profile of DMS versus salinity, you can see the low salinity water is associated with pretty low concentrations of DMS near the surface, really. Whereas the, there was quite high concentrations down down below, just a few centimeters down below. And if you build up, you know, we collected quite a few of those samples and you get a quite a nice relationship between DMS concentration and salinity in those top two meters of seawater. And this, this is a you know another sort of case study of what some of the measurements we made, and I should have pointed out, but in, in the um, dynamic flux chamber, the highest concentrations were measured, highest fluxes were measured early on, about 18th of July, and they were associated with this larger sort of lead that we we sampled at the time, and you can see in this case the water seemed to be mixed mixing so we've got salinities here of um about 10 15 ppt this is a salinity here and pretty high dms concentrations right up to the surface so that lens in this case the, the freshwater lens was sort of getting eroded and allowing much higher fluxes of dms out of that lead and these are this is just a time series of of those measurements actually I won't go into that um so you often one of the things we were interested in and you often hear about is that there might be fluxes of these some of these gases actually happening through through the sea ice and um that was you know that was one of the reasons for trying to use this dynamic flux chamber and this is just a record of the dms uh, measurements that we made the dms flux measurements that we made over snow, snow and ice and you can see a lot of the time it was indistinguishable from zero really but we did did measure some some fluxes and actually on occasion influxes of dms into those surfaces and they're not if you if you compare them to other studies that have done something similar there aren't very many studies that have but in this case daiki nomura and co did some studies in the antarctic on land fast ice they measured fluxes um so this is fluxes 
on snow covered ice of pretty a pretty similar order so less than a hundred nanomoles per meter squared per day from from those um, sites and when they removed the snow and that covered a sort of slush layer of DM, DMS rich algae then they got much much higher flush uh, flux rates but that that sort of community didn't really occur in the sea ice that we were working with in the central Arctic. And again, here's another example of an estimate of some of the fluxes that might occur through the sea ice in certain situations. And this is in the Canadian Arctic archipelago. And um, they calculated or estimated flux rates from diffusion rates of um, potential diffusion rates of gases through, through the ice and through the snow. And yeah, came up with values that were quite a bit higher than we observed, 300 to, you know, 1,000 nanomolar DMS per day. But, you know, that's further south than we were and in, in biologically much richer um, sort of sea ice than we worked with in legs four and five. What's kind of interesting and worth noting is that by the time there was actually a big gap between legs three and legs four, and we missed probably a month of um, observations at that time. And actually, that was from sort of mid May to mid June, that gap happened. And it was really just as the melt started. So, this is some data from Chris Cox et al. from Boulder. And um, yeah, they me measured the sort of net um, heat flux and could really pinpoint when the melt, when the sea ice started melting for sure. And they came up with a day of like 25th of May. So that was quite a bit earlier than we, we started measuring DMS fluxes or anything like that. And it might be that we missed some of the highest DMS fluxes that occurred in the region, but that's something that Jacqueline in particular and I have talked about and want to try and investigate a little bit more. And one of the other interesting things that you know, happened as a, possibly as a consequence of that deposition of DMS in, into the melt ponds and into the surface, uh, freshwater surfaces of some of the leads is that those higher DMS concentrations or so, those high DMS, sorry, those fluxes of DMS into the um, surface may, might have provided a source of dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, so DMS is photochemically transformed to dimethyl sulfoxide, and that might be why these pretty elevated levels of DMSO were seen in the, in those near the surface in those um, low salinity waters. And so that that's quite an interesting and un something we hadn't thought about before, I suppose. And it, it, it's not, it's still just an idea, really. Okay, so what do we want to do next? Um, one of the things that we talk, I talked about was trying to partition the surface, the fluxes from the different surfaces in order to explain the flux is from the eddy covariance system and the variability in the in those flux measurements. And this, this these are footprints of eddy covariance um, system set up on the front of the ship and at the, what was called the Met City. So we had another eddy covariance system set up there, and but the, only the the one on the ship was able to measure the DMS fluxes. But so that that's one thing we want to try and do with the data to try and explain variability in these um, measurements. And yeah, and then one of the sort of difficulties we'll have with that is that the flux chamber obviously isolates the surface that it's measuring the fluxes from from the ambient wind. And there's a pretty you know significant wind or friction velocity impact on transfer velocity so that this is a study that by Hubert et al that sort of just demonstrates the transfer velocity relationship to wind speed or friction velocity in this case on on open waters 
So one thing we're trying to do with the flux chamber now is actually characterize the wind speed within using a very small micro anemometer to try and characterize the wind speed within that um, flux chamber at the various flow rates that we used. Okay, and then the other thing that we want to try and do is, you know, do some back trajectory analysis to try and um, figure out where the high DMS um, air masses that we observed came from. And we'll we'll do something similar to what Boyer, Matt Boyer et al. have done here, where they've been able to um, calculate or work out the footprint contributions from these different geographic areas ar around the Central Arctic. And you can see here that in, in the summer, a lot of those back trajectories are influenced by the ocean and ice in particular. So that those two sort of sources really dominate the, um, uh, yeah, the contact really with those air masses that reached us in in in, um, in the summer on Mosaic. So that you know that might explain why we're getting pretty high DMS concentrations as as those air masses are traveling traveling across water and marginal ice zones south of the ship in the summer. Okay, so I'll just wrap up. Um, some of the so our atmospheric concentrations are comparable to some of the higher values that you see around the margins of the Arctic. And yeah, that these rapid sort of changes in concentration and high, high concentrations probably illustrate vector air masses. Um, most of the fluxes that we measured were pretty low. So the local fluxes are pretty low and we can partition that between these different um, surfaces. And it seems like the open water leads dominate despite that fresh water layer that we came across and yeah we've we've still got to work out the various sort of the total areas of each of those surfaces and within the footprints of the eddy covariance systems in order to really nail that down but there's lots of information from the mosaic sort of um, expedition that should allow us to do that and yet, yeah, one of the really interesting things, and there's a nice um, overview paper coming out of it led by Maddie Smith, is that, you know, the extensive and persistent freshwater layer that we came across that, you know, lasted months and, and seemed to cover a, a really large part of the Central Arctic at times. And, yeah. We've seen DMS depositions for some, for the first time, possibly, and into the uh, into the ocean, and that might fuel or drive the production of DMS in those those surface waters. Okay, I think that's all I I've got to say at the moment. Thanks, and yeah, thanks for the invitation. I should have said at the beginning for uh, allowing me to do this talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Yeah, thank great talk. Thank you very much. One quick question. Anyone? Ah, Brent. Brent has a question. Yeah. Hi, Steve. Brent else from the University of Calgary. Thanks. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, quick question. I was trying to follow your units on the fluxes for the chambers and the eddy covariance. So I'm just wondering how well those two uh, reconcile. Are they within the same order, or you know, like what do, what do they look like when you compare the, the two? different ways of measuring fluxes. Yeah, I mean, they're in the same order, right? But uh, <laughs> the, the chamber the chamber measurements are generally lower. And you know, that, you, you'd you kind of expect that, I think, because of that um, fact that you're cutting out any wind influence, really. Or, and there's few, we've, as I said, we've started trying to measure the air velocities, the surface air velocities in that chamber. And it's... Um, they're, they're pretty low. They're at the lower end of the wind speeds that, you, that we experienced. So, yeah. Well, good. That's definitely a lot better than the carbon people did. When we started <laughs> this. Yeah, we started in the bad place. We <laughs> seem to have it mostly started up. Any, any other cool? We've got time for one more. Any, any other questions for Steve? 
in the room, the folks online. Hello. Oh, yep. Somebody. Yeah. Which software was used to calculate the estimate the fluxes? Was it Eddy Pro? Um, I don't think so. I think so. Byron will have calculated the fluxes for the Eddy covariance, and I think he writes his own code in Python to do that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, thank you very much once again, Steve. <laughs> and now let's move on. Uh, Mati and Daniela, which of you starting? I'm starting, thanks. <laughs> so I will okay. share my Welcome screen. <laughs> Okay, can I share my screen? Yes, you should be able to. Great. Great, can you see it? No, ah, not sorry. Yet. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, now it should be fine. Here it comes, okay. Yep. Perfect. Now, now you can you see it. Great. Go ahead. Good. So, well, hi everyone, and thanks for inviting us today to introduce this new um, score working group, which just started activity a couple of months ago, <clears throat> which is called DMS Pro. So, Daniela Del Valle and myself, we are the co-chairs of this group, which uh, is composed of 18 other people from many places. And the talk is split in two. So I will first introduce a little bit the, the, the motivation for, for this working group and some um, issues specific to polar oceans. And, and then Daniela will um, talk about the, 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 our objectives, uh, what, our, what, our, what are our plans, basically. So DMS Pro stands for Developing Resources for the Study of, of Methylated Sulfur Compound Cycling Processes in the Ocean. So it's not just about DMS, it's about methylated sulfur compounds, including uh, many, many more compounds. And it's about processes, so cycling and rates. Okay. So I think I will go a bit quickly over all these introductory slides because I think Jacqueline and Sakiko and Steve have done a great job introducing the, the topic. And these initial slides are a bit overlapping with, with the previous ones. So basically, as, as you know, um, the processes we are looking at start mostly with the, the production of the MSP at dimethyl sulfonia propionate by phytoplankton mostly, but also by other organisms and we are learning in, in recent years, like heterotrophic, heterotrophic bacteria and some other heterotrophs. But in, in pelagic waters, we can assume it's mostly phytoplankton. They produce this compound, which is an, an osmolite to help them cope with salinity, stress, and also with, it can also be a cryoprotectin, it seems. It's been suggested to be an antioxidant. It's a multifunctional compound, which is then um, transformed by the microbial food webs through many pathways, very complex pathways, which are not, I'm not going to, to, to explain in detail here, but Jacqueline has shown before. And some of the products of these transformations are the volatiles dimethyl sulfide, but also methane thiol, that as you know, is gaining some attention recently which is well-deserved, <laughs> probably. <laughs> and we have been overlooking it. So once these compounds are emitted to the atmosphere, they can they are oxidized quite quickly and they can form, well, um, they are oxidized to sulfuric acid or methyl sulfonic acid with some intermediates as well, which can eventually nucleate new particles. And these particles can grow large enough to act as cloud colonization nuclei. This CCN will, well, the aerosols themselves will scatter sunlight and the CCN 
will modify the optical and macrophysical properties of, of, of clouds, and this will induce different types of radiative forcing. So this will modify the radiative, the radiative balance of the atmosphere. This is the, the big picture. So why is it important to study these compounds? As I was saying, they represent a major contribution to the radiative forcing uncertainty. So some of these interactions are not well resolved in terms of understanding and, and predictive um, modeling. And then in, in polar areas in particular, um, it's important to study these compounds and their implication in relative feedbacks, also because of the connections between high latitude environments and, and lower and lower latitudes through the teleconnections. And biogenic sulfur emissions are also becoming relatively more important, perhaps, as anthropogenic um, sulfur dioxide emissions from the fossil fuel burning decline. And the, there has been a decline over the last decades in some Northern countries, and this might be followed by declines in, in in, in, in other countries in, in, in the coming decades. And as you are all aware of uh, this, well, polar um, geosystems and ecosystems are changing extremely rapidly under the pressure of, of uh, anthropogenic uh, change. But as we all also know, these changes are different in the Arctic and Antarctic um, areas right so here i put this this plots below with the variation in the center of, of the sea the minimum sea ice extent annual sea ice extent in the antarctic which has been oscillating a lot in recent years and lately declining and to the right the well-known decrease in arctic sea ice extent over the last um decades good So when we study the volatile sulfur emission from polar oceans, we are facing uh, additional challenges compared to, to the open ocean environments because there is a wide vari variety of source environments as, as we <clears throat> and know there is emission from, from the open ocean, but also from the marginalized zone, which is which has some complex interactions between ice cover and, and, and waters. There is emissions from ice environments themselves, like the bottom ice communities, melt ponds, um, ice cracks, the leads that form between, well, that form across the, the, the ice pack and, and so on. Another characteristic of, of polar environments is that they have localized hotspots of, of emissions, but these emissions are quite ephemeral and there is extreme spatial and temporal variability. And this is true also for the pelagic environment. And they are also remote and difficult for, to sample. And there is a scarcity of consistent historical time series. So it's hard to know what is the, the baseline. Good. So when we study the interaction between ocean and atmosphere through the, the emission of sulfur volatiles, it's very important. Uh, a very important problem is the upscaling. So we have some in-situ measurements that we need to upscale to the right spatial temporal and resolution. And there is a number of, of approaches to that. We can compute climatologies based on interpolation of observations. And there is a, well, a long tradition of, of computing these climatologies. There's the Kettle 99, the LANA 2011, and a recent climatology. We can also try to reconstruct these emission fields using Earth observation, using empirical algorithms, both climatological or non-climatological, so, so time series. More recently, there has been a surge of, of, of machine learning approaches, which might become the, the norm. And we also have prognostic biogeochemical models, which we can use to reconstruct historical trends, but also to make projections in, in for different climate change scenarios and, and so on. And each of these approaches has strengths and weaknesses. So I wanted to, to briefly um, compare 
where are we at um, in terms of upscaling this, these emissions and how the, the activities we are proposing in DMS Pro can fit in, the, in this landscape. So where, what is the landscape that DMS Pro is, is born in? And for example, uh, we can start looking at climatological estimates of Arctic DMS emission. And this is for the Arctic summer. And we can, I'm, I'm showing this plot from a study by Hakase Ayashida in 2020. And in this, in this study, Hakase um, well, and, and colleagues, and they developed this, this prognostic model to estimate um, DMS emissions, uh, well, DMS cycling and emissions in the Arctic, both in, from seawater and, 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 and ice. And they compared this to a remote sensing approach that we see in the central um, row. And on the, on the bottom, you see the climatologies. And there is a very obvious feature here is that the climatology is extremely smooth compared to both the remote sensing approaches and the prognostic models. And given that we care a lot about where and where the emissions are taking place, because this will impact this will so the, the atmospheric impacts of the emissions will depend on when and where are they are taking place the, the background aerosols and the water the, the origins of the of their masses and, and so on so climatologies are probably not not enough we need a more better more resolved approaches like like prognostic modeling probably and um, it's not so what's the situation in the in the Antarctic around the Antarctic continent and, and, and in the Southern Ocean? Here, as, as um, Jacqueline was mentioning before, um it's a region that well, well that is producing a, a huge part of the global DMS emissions. And where the spatial and temporal um, distribution of these emissions is not very well resolved, very well understood yet. So there has been have been important changes from the previous climatology in 2011 and the most recent one, as you see here in the bottom plot here. And very recently, there was a, a, new, a new paper came out um, introducing these machine learning approaches to reconstruct the MS emission fields in the Southern Ocean. And it showed there was a lot of mesoscale and submesoscale structure which we know very little about, and very important localized uh, host, host spots around the, the Antarctic continent and also in some open ocean areas. Good. Here I'm showing another result from another study that I did with colleagues uh, um, some years ago. And in the case, we, fo we focused on the interannual variability. And again, is, this is a dimension we are not used uh, to looking at, but in, in the Arctic, at least, there is a strong trend in in the DMS in the, in, in the emissions, driven mostly by the ice, sea ice extent, ice, sea ice um, melt in summer, no? that the, the is uh, recession. But we also see some changes due to the local variations in sea surface DMS and CR DMS fluxes. So we need to understand these, these different sources of, of a variation that can control larger scale emissions. And finally, I wanted to show to, to complete this, this picture and uh, what are we at, where, where are we at in terms of making future projections in, in climate change scenarios. And here the situation is a bit dramatic because when we rely only on, 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 on prognostic models, like in this um, global biogeochemical models used in the CMIP exercises. Ah, thanks, um, Steve, for, for the, the, yeah. Okay, we see there is a strong discrepancy between different, um, between different projections in this case. So different models are predicting anything from no trend to um, strong positive trends in DMS emissions in different polar areas. And this uncertainty is mainly due to poor knowledge of the cycling processes. 
And this is where I wanted to arrive. And the number of C surface DMS measurements in the PML, PML, PML database, which has been used to make climatologies and to validate models, has increased extremely fast in recent years, mostly because uh, thanks to the, the, the automated measurements. But if we want to improve our models, we also need great measurements. And these measurements are scarce, and we are not adding new measurements at a sufficient rate and with sufficient spatiotemporal resolution to be able to evaluate models and to improve um, models to make better projections. And to give you a feeling of the scarcity of these measurements, we made this compilation in 2015. And you see that, well, you don't have to look at each individual plot. These are the, the distribution of different key cycling um, rates or parameters that control sulfur cycling. And you see that in all cases, the number of measurements is in the range of the few tens to a few um, 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 hundreds. So that's not enough. And finally, before I give the, the floor to Daniela, it's very important that we start linking understanding how the, the, the biogeochemical rates are connected to the genes, so the organisms present in, in, the, in, the, in the water, and, and their activities, so the, the transcription of, of um, specific genes. But currently, it's, we, all the studies trying to link rates to genes have had a hard time, so we don't have yet this predictive capacity. And again, there has been an explosion in sequence data in, in metagenomes and metatranscriptomes and so on. But we are way behind in, in relating this to the in situ rates. And thanks. So, and, and this in this nice review that came up in a couple of years ago, they showed that some genes may be more prevalent in, in polar oceans than in, in, in other regions of the global ocean. And that's it. So I give the floor to Daniela, who will introduce the objectives of DMS Pro. Thanks. All right. So let me share my screen. All right. OK. Can you see it? Yes, perfect. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so hello, um, everybody. Um, with Marty, we wanted to quickly introduce uh, our new SCORE working group. Uh, you already know the name. Uh, so our goal for today is for you to get a glimpse on what the resources that we are planning to develop will be. OK, let me see. All right. Um, so, as you probably know, uh, SCORE working groups are meant to be diverse, and we, we feel like we accomplished that. We have 10 full and 10 associate members nicely spread out uh, geographically uh, with a good gender balance and with expertise in uh, different fields, um, biogeochemistry, microbial oceanography, molecular microbiology, photochemistry, CER exchange, modeling, database management, et cetera. Um, I don't have time to introduce everyone, but uh, I'm sure you, you see a few uh, familiar faces in there. Uh, so you already saw this image today. Um, as you know, um, also as we mentioned, uh, the marine sulfur cycle can be quite complex. And this scheme uh, partially reflects that because it is already 15 years old, old and since then we have learned that um, this cycle can uh, be is even uh, more um, intricate uh, with the discovery of new methylated sulfur compounds and new processes. Um, also, this scheme is reflecting the sulfur cycle uh, in the pelagic environment, so it is not considering processes that are relevant in other more complex environments. For example, this figure would look quite differently if we were to adapt it to a polar environment. So uh, DMS Pro, like uh, any other score working group, was born from the need to 
fill in gaps in knowledge that would benefit from the expertise of, um, of a wide and diverse group. And one of the main issues that we wanted to tackle was the lack of standardized protocols for the determination of cycling rates of methylated sulfur compounds. Um, the first measurements date back like late 80s. And since then there has been a lot of progress, uh, of course, in the development of techniques for the determination of these rates. Um, however, we currently do not have guidelines and protocols to basically um, guide the making of these measurements. And uh, in hand with this issue, we think that there is a need to be able to evaluate uh, critically the methods being used, um, especially their, their limitations. And most importantly, these um, rate measurements are not easy to make. Um, not many labs are making these measurements, um, not many groups. So we, we realized that there was a need to compile past and, and future measurements in a format that will allow us to make the most out of the information gathered so far. So to address these issues, we proposed as an objective of the MS Pro to try to develop community consensus on the measurement of cycling rates on methylated sulfur compounds. We plan to create and publish SOPs, or well, standard operating procedures, and also guidelines and recommendations on when each method should be used. We want to be able to inform users and not only current users, but hopefully also future users of these methods of um, the considerations um, and the assumptions, the assumptions that are being made when using each specific uh, methodological approach. So how are we going to get there? Well, we are planning to do this by discussing and evaluating the different techniques that are being used. And the idea is to have this discussion not only within uh, the working group, but also in open workshops that we hope can be attended by, by the extended sulfur uh, scientific community. And very importantly, one of our main objectives is to compile a comprehensive database on cycling rates of these compounds. And this database will be open access. It will follow the FAIR principles, uh, meaning that we we will make it easy to find, to access, to interoperate, and to reuse the data that we that we gather in there. Uh, right now, we are planning to use the AirDAP data server from NOAA to, to distribute this database. Um, AirDAP has um, kind of recently been adopted by the DMS and DMSP concentration database. So it makes it makes sense, it will be useful to have the same server for, for these two uh, databases. Um, and before we get to build our database, we will need to review and discuss the different processes that will be included in it. Um, of course, we want the database to be relevant, to be informative, uh, but we will have limitations in terms of the processes that will make uh, the cut. Um, also, our first uh, effort will focus on the pelagic environment, both uh, coastal and open ocean, but we hope that in the future uh, the database will include other marine environments like uh, sea ice, uh, like polar regions. And um, another important factor for us to take uh, into consideration is what other variables are going to be included in the database. We want to make sure that we include uh, known drivers, but not only that, but also hypothesized drivers, right? So we can get um, a better understanding of the relationship uh, with the sulfur cycle. And of course, we want to develop a transparent framework, a um, reproducible workflow. Uh, so to achieve this, all the scripts that, we, um, that will be used in the data processing will be posted on, on a repository and, and encapsulated in um, a well-documented software package. Uh, so this will include the scripts used for data pre-processing, like um, 
like the application of quality control criteria or standardization of units and so forth, uh, as well as the scripts used in data post processing. And again, all the products, uh, the products, sorry, um, following the FAIR principles. And we're planning on preparing a few more deliverables in the form of scientific papers, a database, <clears throat> excuse me, a database description paper, um, a paper providing guidance on the use of the database for um, model development and model evaluation, <clears throat> and uh, also an overview of uh, existing knowledge on the cycling of these compounds, excuse me. <clears throat> and hopefully also identifying uh, priorities for future research. Um, as you probably know, an overarching goal of score working groups is to build capacity on the topic in question. So um, we plan to provide building capacity by promoting the adoption of the database, the software package, the SOPs, and to achieve, um, yeah, to achieve this, we plan to uh, engage researchers and students, hopefully from the, with diverse profiles. And we will soon put together our website and multimedia platforms to advertise our activities. And some of those will include um, online tutorials, online and hybrid uh, training events, and open workshops. So you can expect in the near future to hear from us. And we would also love to hear from, from you as well and for you to reach out if you would like to contribute somehow to, to this group. So uh, closing up, we, we hope that the MS Pro will, will help uh, in consolidating the knowledge gathered in the past decades on the cycling of methylated sulfur compounds. And we also hope that the products from this working group will be useful to identify knowledge gaps and to stimulate new research, um, interdisciplinary research, research relating the sulfur cycle variables to other biogeochemical variables, and um, also to molecular and mixed data. And we also aim to provide a tool that will um, improve the use of cycling rates of, of these methylated sulfur compounds on, on predictive models. And with that, um, on behalf of the whole DMS Pro Working Group, I want to thank um, I want to thank Solas and Bepsi and and Jack and Lisa for for having us uh, join join you in this seminar. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, we've got one question on the line. First, and then Nadia's got one in the room. Hyung Yu, do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much. Um, I have a question to Marty. Um, this uh, fascinating time series for the Earth system model, DMS bias. And then I'm just curious about what components in the Earth system model could drive that DMS bias, for example, um, DMS formulation. Um, crude of DMS formulation itself, otherwise other components such as a sea ice bias or plankton bias, something like that. So I'm just, I'm just curious to your aspects. Um, well, I'm not sure I, I fully understood the, the, <clears throat> the question, but you're asking about the, the biases in, in the model representation of, of DMS, right? And the drivers of internal variations, or? So I noticed that the time series from the PI control on, and feature climate scenario um, to 2100. So mm -hmm. they have some big spread within the R system model in, in the initially. And then we can see the feature changes also very spread out. So I'm just curious if the, this problem is coming from the DMS. Mm -hmm. Equations itself, otherwise other components such as the sea ice bias or plankton bias are there. So, um... well, in, in in general, I don't know the all those models and all, all those model configurations um, in, in detail in, enough to to be able to to to, re, to respond that. But in general, 
when we model um, the sulfur cycle, we are piling up different types of uncertainties. We have uncertainties in the circulation, in the physics, which are then, um, uh, we are driving uncertainties in, in, in the, in the um, ecosystem model, right? So the uncertainties in, in nutrient value, in, in, in the circulation, vertical mixing, and nutrient supply, and so on. And cause biases in, in the in the ecosystem. And then on top of that, we add the sulfur cycling module. So there is a risk that we are tuning the models to compensate for biases that are in the in the underlying physical models or underlying ecosystem models. So the our point in, in DMS Pro is that by providing this, this database with um, created and um, great measurements and some guidelines as to how to, to, to use these measurements or to what do they represent. We can reduce biases in the sulfur cycling modules. Of course, <laughs> the biases in the, in the biochemical and, 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 and circulation models have, have to be dealt with in, in another part of the, of the work, but <laughs> that's, that's our view. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Thanks. And then, thank you, uh, Yungyo and Marty. Nadia, do you wanted to go ahead? And... Yeah, I have a question for the Marty and um, uh, Danielle regarding the data compilation. We had a discussion this morning at the Pepsi meeting about uh, comp compiling da DMS data in CIs, and there was a recent compilation for the Antarctic from the Australian or led by the Australian group, uh, which is um, uh, being uh, prepared for publication, uh, but not for the Arctic. And there was definitely some interest and we wanted to know if that is something that you are planning or if we should pursue that as BEPS, like within the Pepsi group. I think that there is some capacity and we had some discussion about that. Marty, no, you can, you can answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, I was yeah, going to say, that, say that that's something we should discuss. Uh, the two groups that would be interesting to to discuss and see what what we what we can do and what's the best approach. Marty. Um, so I I'm not sure I I I, I got it right. You mentioned DMS concentration. Measurements? Yeah, yeah. DMS concentration measurements in sea ice. Yeah. So in DMS Pro, the, in principle, we are interested in compiling the rate, transformation rate. Uh -huh. Not so much. Uh, well, I, of course, these rates are always linked to, to, to concentration measurements. Yeah. And I think like if there is like, like if there's a compilation, we would definitely try to like if a group has DMS concentrations and rates to put them together rather than separating them. Um, but the focus is really just to get us the, at the DMS concentrations. Hmm. But we can definitely talk more about that. It was it was yes. just, just wanted to make sure that like you've already set something up and planned it that we we don't do the same work from two sides. I think that's my main concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. It's important we keep like communicating very and um, often and 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 yeah. This good communication is important to to make sure we are not duplicating effort. Yeah. <laughs> It sounds like we're safe, but we should keep talking to each other. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> it, seems, it seems so. <laughs> so at this point, we have 10 minutes remaining. <clears throat> and so I'd like to um, invite all, all three of our, all four, excuse me, of our speakers to uh, turn on cameras and we can open up the floor for questions for, for all of you together. And we actually already have a controversial one that I know is going to get some people riled up in the um, uh, uh, chat from uh, Jorgen Jensen. Um, looking back to uh, uh, another SOLAS seminar a couple months ago, talking about the North Atlantic and CCN concentration. So I, essentially the question boils down to one that does keep coming up, which is, 
is Claw dead and is it relevant and why are we still studying BMS? So I open, open that, Jurgen, do you want to go ahead and, and, and uh, ask your question and then we can let our four speakers um, each give their own perspective on that. Yep, thank you. And thank you for very interesting seminars. Uh, I have to say Bob Charlson was on my committee many, uh, many years ago. So, um, but the question really is that uh, Sarah Brooks concluded looking at CCN particles and their chemical composition that the, um, by far most of the, uh, C uh, well, the CCN in the North Atlantic were from sea spray and not uh, so much from DMS. And I think she had hoped that the DMS pathway was going to be the most important one, but that's not really uh, what she found. So from the, the people present here today, is the uh, DMS contribution to CCN a smaller modulation or is it really still what we would consider quite a major modulation? So, Sakiko, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think I should be the person to respond to it. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, that there actually, it is true that a certain area of the ocean globally, CCN is the main component of CCN. Uh, no, sea spray is the main component of CCN. But in case of the the polar regions, especially for the summertime Arctic, there are many debates that showing that that arguing the, the 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 summertime Arctic Ocean, the, the atmosphere is kind of um, uh, how to say the composed of very stable uh, stable states that is not really producing a lot of CCN from sea spray. And uh, in there, the new particle formation can be an important source of CCN in this very small region of the ocean, particularly for the Arctic. And I have not seen it. I, I do not have any clear idea for the Antarctic, but still um, there, there are many papers showing that the uh, DMS can be a CCN source in the, 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 the Southern Ocean regions. Uh, am I responding to your question correctly? Yeah, I, I know that there was a modulation of about a factor two in CCN in Tasmania between summer and winter. So there, there clearly is something there, but that couldn't, that might be for other reasons also than TMS. Uh, it could also be because of changes in wind speed and uh, and so on. So um, it, it's possible. I mean, I, I don't know, I'm just asking. So, <laughs> so, so I, I like to pose this as a debate, still uh, as a debate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's the impression I've gotten from just listening, not being at all an expert in DMS, is that globally, yeah, maybe it's not so important, but in the polls, the the jury is very much still out. Um, do we have another? Oh, Mat Matigebe uh, provided a, a reference in the chat for people who are interested in reading more. And Carrie has something to say. Do you want to... Um, Unmute Carrie and, and go ahead and say it. Uh, sure, I was just uh, saying that both Caroline Leck and my groups um, have shown both local sea spray aerosol formation and secondary sulfate formation through new particle formation um, in the summertime in the Arctic and multiple locations, including the pack ice. And so I think it's important to think about not one that it's one or the other, but really that there's contributions from both and that the, 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 the fraction probably varies based on the situation because sea spray aerosol is episodic and we, we've seen today the DMS produ production is episodic. And, and so we would expect the fractions of each um, to change significantly with, in time and place. 
So it's the classic answer in our business. It's complicated and it depends. <laughs> yep. <laughs> exactly. Lots more work to do. <laughs> okay. Any any other questions, thoughts, comments? Anybody? Or thanks, everyone. We're, yeah, we're too. we're we're definitely coming up on coffee break time here, and. Um, I know that, well, it, it, you know, we still have a few minutes. So if you do have anything you want to bring up or ask, um, no, that's a, <laughs> Ava's scratching her head. She distracted me. <laughs> um, I want to um, thank all of our speakers for, for logging in and doing this. This is really interesting. And this group was certainly here in the room where we're uh, staying awake. I also particularly want to thank Cheng Cheng who got up at 3.30 this morning after only three hours of sleep in order <laughs> to um, moderate or in order to uh, support us today with uh, logistically. So, so particularly, thank you to <laughs> Oh, we, oh no, those are just claps. Okay, no hands up. <laughs> yeah, Carrie's added another citation that can be useful to folks. Um, so I encourage all of you to anyone who's interested in this stuff to uh, to contact the speakers with additional questions and also stay stay um, is, uh, stay tuned for results and work from both CI to clouds and DMS Pro. I think they're going. To, I think it's it's pretty safe to say that both of those groups are going to move our our community forward. When and where will the recording of this meeting be available? Cheng Cheng, can you answer that? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> After he's had a nap. Oh, and another reference from Sakiko. So with that, I want to thank everyone again. And um, particularly thank Solas for the opportunity to bring us all together. And once again, to our speakers. Anything else? Jack, did you want to say anything? Excuse me. Nope, it's fine. <laughs> it's very late at night for Jack. I think she's ready to go to bed. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Yep. Okay. Good evening, Thanks. good morning, good night. Have a